back when I was in high school, I believe I was a junior, there is uh, someone in, our, in my school or, uh, that was kind of like the worst person. You know, when you think back of high school, do you like know who like the bad person was? You know, like who personified like everything that you shouldn't do in life? Well, when I was a junior, he got saved. And it was one of those things where it was just a dramatic transformation. And he ended up going to the church that I attended. And so the Lord put it on my heart to disciple him. Totally different personalities. 100% different personalities. But I got the, kind of like got this front seat to like this amazing thing that God did in his life. And you know, you've heard the phrase that like, Somebody is on fire for God. Well, this guy was not only on fire for God, but like on fire and shot out of a cannon for God. I mean, he was like all in, like 100% different and everything like that. And everywhere that he went, it was always like telling people about Jesus, telling people about Jesus, you know, every chance he could possibly have. But what I found really interesting And really what is one of the things that led me to this message is the response of the seasoned Christians. Because sometimes there is these rumors and there is this talk on the side of, he'll calm down. That bothered me. Because I, I couldn't understand, why did we want him to calm down? You know, why did we want him to lose that fire that he had for telling people about Jesus? And I mean, thankfully, he didn't calm down. He's traveled the world telling people about Jesus. He's got a heart for people, for Muslims and goes there to to, to spread the gospel. But what I really wanted to, to think about is those seasoned Christians, you know, why was it that they, they were bothered by his actions, by his enthusiasm, his fervor for the gospel? And I think it's because it made them feel uncomfortable. And honestly, probably a little bit guilty because they didn't possess that same fervor and excitement that he had in his life. And I remember even in that time, I myself was growing, for my own life, like I was growing a lot in the Lord. And I, and I almost took that as a warning, like, I don't want to become like those people that looked down on him. I myself didn't want to calm down. You know, I wanted to to keep like being excited about God, about reading his word, about prayer. And I never wanted to lose that enthusiasm. And so I've really been, honestly, ever since then, thinking about what makes that change. Where some people can accept Christ into their life, and it's like this dramatic transformation. Where literally everything about them becomes about Jesus and about telling people about Jesus, and about prayer, and everything that they look at is through this lens of, of, of God and God's kingdom. Whereas other people, they can like accept Christ into your life, and there's almost no change. They just kind of still blend into the world, you know? And, and so what is it that causes those different responses in different people? And that's where it came to this message that I'm going to give today because shortly after my last message, I do what I always do, and I'm like, Lord, you know, what do you want me to speak about next? And simply the words, the cross, came to my mind. You know, and I thought, my first thought was, and, you know, I mean, I, I needed a little bit more information to go on. And as I continued to pray about, like, what do you, what do you want me to say, Lord, about the cross? You know, it really came to to. For me, I realized that this might be the difference of what causes some people to have that excitement and that drive for the gospel and other people to, to just kind of stay steady maybe. I, I, you know, I don't, wanna, I don't know the exact word to use there, but th- they don't have that drive. They still just blend in with this world. And so what we're going to look at today is how, what, pri- or what um, um, place the cross plays in our drive for the Lord, our fervency of the Lord. And I think a lot of it is, do you get it? Do you understand what truly happened at the cross? And I think for us to understand what happened at the cross, we first have to understand, why do we need the cross? It always starts there. Because if you don't understand why we need the cross, you can't understand the importance of the cross. And I'm going to go all the way back to Moses. 
And in Numbers 20, 11 through 12, um, this was where the Israelites were wandering in the desert, and they were thirsty, you know, and, and so they start grumbling against God and everything like that. This isn't the first time it's happened. It's happened many times. And so Moses evidently is a little bit tired of it, okay? So God commands him, I want you to speak to the rock, and water will come out of the rock. So we start in verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Now, let's be honest here. You don't have to show hands. Has anybody ever read this passage? And, and let me, I guess, explain this a little. Because Moses hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock, that was a sin. And because of his actions, God was like, you will not lead the Israelites into the promised land. You know, he led them up to the promised land, but was not able to go in. Has anybody else ever read this and thought, that seems a little extreme? Anybody? I have. But you want to know why I think we, we have that thought? We underestimate sin. We honestly don't totally get what sin is in the eyes of God. You know, it, hitting the rock instead of speaking to the rock was not what God commanded him to do. It was a sin. And you see... I believe we have this strong desire to be considered good, don't we? We all want to go through life. We all want to be viewed in this congregation, our businesses, maybe our neighborhoods, as good people. And I think the reason that this bothers us so much is because nobody in this congregation was as good as Moses. And so when we read that, like, God was not pleased with this one sin, it kind of makes us think, well, what about me? You know, where do I stand? Another person that I think we would naturally consider, like, a good guy would be Isaiah. You know, the prophet Isaiah. He wrote, like, a huge book of the Bible, like 60-some chapters and stuff. You know, he's got to be considered good. God spoke through him. You know, and God, God chose him to, like, you know prophesied to the nation of Israel. You know, I mean, he has to be a good guy, right? Yet look in Isaiah 6, 5. When Isaiah had a vision of God, his response is, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of Almighty. So this good guy, this prophet, his response is, woe to me. I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. Are we sure he was good? In the eyes of God, was he good? You see, all throughout the Bible, there's a common theme when people have a vision of God. They don't feel so good. You see? You see, we underestimate what our sin looks like in the eyes of God. And if you're a fortunate person like Isaiah who gets this vision of God, you're reminded very quickly of how you appear compared to God. One time, this man came to Jesus, you know, and he says, you know, um, good teacher. Jesus, I don't, didn't seem to acknowledge the rest. Because, well, I'll just read here. Starting in uh, verse 18 of Luke 18, it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. Now, I think what Jesus said here obviously was, was uh, genius, to be honest. Because what he is saying is, There is nobody on earth that is good. Okay. And this, but, the, but what we do know is Jesus was good. So if God alone is good and Jesus is good, then we can come to the simple conclusion. Jesus is good, therefore Jesus is God. You know, and I think that was the, the teaching that Jesus was providing to this man. 
But what I want to focus on is this fact that Jesus says, if, if God alone is good, then we aren't good. You know, we want to be good. We want to be viewed as good, but we aren't. And this might seem harsh. You know, you might be sitting there thinking like, why is he like harping on this fact that I'm not a good person? And the reason is, is because if, if you convince yourself that you are a good person, you minimize your need for a savior. And that's why this is so important. We need to understand who we are and that we need, we absolutely 100% need to have a savior. Let me give you these two examples. <clears throat> Let's say you're walking along, okay? You're walking with a friend and all of a sudden, you step, step into this big, like, pile of mud, okay? Your foot is a little bit stuck, right? So your friend reaches over, you grab his hand, and you pull your foot out of the mud. What am I going to do? Thanks. I appreciate your help, you know? I could have gotten my foot out, but, you know, it's nice to have a friend that can get you out of the mud when you, when you step in it, right? That's my first example. Second example, you wake up in the middle of the night, blazing inferno around you, Okay? You look around, there is no way out. Fire is all around you. You can't get away. Just when you think, that's it, you know, I'm gone, a fireman breaks through the wall and pulls you out into safety. What's your response to that fireman? Is it the same as when you got your foot stuck in mud? No, it's different. Because you understand that that fireman literally saved your life that you were like certain death. And at the last minute, he pulled you from death and gave you life. So my question is, how do you view Jesus? Is he a friend that helped you out or is he a savior that saved your life? That is important for you to be honest with yourself. Because when I look back at my, that my friend in school, that, that guy that transformed his life, which do you think he views Jesus as? What is it that motivated him to want to change the world for Jesus? To give up his life and go across the world for God's kingdom? Would he do that for a friend that just helped him out? Or would he do that because he knows there's, there's a Savior that saved his life, that pulled him from death and gave him life. And I believe that if we were truly going to be honest with ourselves, those of us that like are like, you know what, whatever I need to do, wherever I go, I'm telling people about Jesus. I think it's because we know that he is our only hope. If there's some of us that are like, well, you know, I go to church, but at work, I'm, I'm just going to kind of blend in. You know, I'm just going to fit in. I don't want to cause waves. I don't want to be the Christian guy. My guess, you might view Jesus as just kind of like a friend that helped you out. But that's not who Jesus is. That isn't what he did for us. That is not what happened at the cross. You see, let's go back and look at some of the ways that the Bible describes us. Psalm 14, 2 through 3 is actually quoted in Romans 3, and it says... The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. This is us. You may think like you're like this holy person. You may think you're this good person. But without Christ, there is no one who's done good. We are filthy. You are a filthy person without Jesus. Amen. We can go on. In Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Ephesians 2.1, it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So what does it mean that we are not good? That we're dead. That we're dead in our transgressions and sins. And there is no alternative. You know, we want to think like, you know, there's like medium ground. Or, no, there's not. There's life and death. And here's the sad truth. If we have all turned away from God, if we are all corrupt, 
If we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we are dead in our transgressions and sins. In Revelation 20, 15, it says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. It doesn't matter if you try to be a nice person. It doesn't, mean if you're, it doesn't matter if you're trying to be better than your neighbor or nicer than your neighbor or kinder than the people at work. This is us, and this is our fate, and this is where we're all headed. And as hard as it may seem, as, as harsh as it may seem, we deserve hell. That is what we each deserve because of our actions, because of the choices that we made, because of the sin in our heart. It, we deserve this. Except. And I love the except. Because the except, God wasn't okay with that. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's what we have to truly come to understand. That it was written in stone. There was no other way. One sin, and that's it. You know, just like Moses was not able to be in the promised land. One sin, you will never see God's face. You will never step foot in heaven. Except we have a God that loves us. I love this passage in 2 Samuel 14, 14. It says, like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. But that is not what God desires. Rather, he devises ways so that a banished person does not remain banished from him. That is amazing grace. That is amazing love. And that's the love that he has for you. It's this reason that God devised a plan that you drop everything and are like, he is who I will serve. This is what causes people to, to, to throw away their old life and start new and afresh and be excited and, and take every opportunity to tell people about God for every chance they get to, to pray, to read the Bible. This is what motivates us when we realize that it's like I was dead, but now I'm alive. Do we truly understand that? Do we grasp who we were? And do we understand what Christ made us to be? You see, what I love is those verses that I, that, that I, I brought up that described like our, our, our hopelessness. There's other parts to them. You see, in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it goes on to say, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, we were lost, but that wasn't what God wanted. So he devised another way. That way is by grace, which happened at the cross. In Ephesians 2, 1, it says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But it goes on to say in verses 4 and 5, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Amen. And it is by grace that our lives are changed and we became anew and excited about serving God. That's why, you know, during the worship service, if you look around and you see those people that are like, they're crying, that their arms are raised high, that they're just giving everything that they've got, it's because they understand this. They understand that I was dead. But now I'm alive, and that's a God that I will serve the rest of my life, that I will never lose my fervor for, my excitement for, because his grace is new for me day after day after day after day, and he takes away the sins that we have committed, all of them. They're washed away, and we are made white, and we are, in God's eyes, made pure. You know, I, 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 Rachel actually shared this with me, and somebody said, like, because of the cross... God looks at Jesus and sees you. And God looks at you and sees Jesus. He took our place. He switched places with us. Even though he was perfect, the only one that didn't deserve this, but he switched with you so that you're viewed as pure in the eyes of God. That's a God that I will serve with all my heart and with 
everything that is within me. So I want to go on to the next part because I feel this is important. At the cross, we changed 100%. But so often, I think we underestimate all that Jesus did at the cross for us. What Jesus did at the cross was complete. Everything that we needed happened at the cross. In Colossians 2, 13 through 14, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So, and I I love that, that legal indebtedness, because we owed something that we could not pay. So Jesus took that and and nailed it to the cross. But there's a great deception that's going on. And that deception is that I believe that the the devil, since the day Jesus died on the cross, is, is spreading a lie. And the lie is that even though you might be saved, you will never be free here on earth. And I think that's a lie that we have bought into too often. Because in Galatians 5.1, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You see, and too often, we say, yes, I've become a Christian. But you know what? I just walk around with, with that guilt of sin. I walk around with those addictions with the the shame, with the stress, with the anxiety. I walk around with all of this stuff because it's like that's that's just who that what I am. You know, I'm just going to continue to struggle. Yeah, I may go to heaven, but boy, I'm just going to struggle here on earth. But you see again in Galatians 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And what I want to ask is is for what Jesus did at the cross, was it limited or was it complete? If Jesus says that you can be free, can you be free? Yes. If Jesus says you can be free, will you walk in guilt? Will you be, be walk in stress and anxiety and worry? You can be free. And that's what I want to stress about the cross today. Do not limit the power of the cross in your life. Once you believed in Jesus, once he washed away all of those sins, once he made you new, every single promise in the Bible belongs to you. Every single one of them. Now, don't be mistaken. That does not equal an easy life. In John 16, it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I am not saying that we're going to like walk in a, a valley of lilies the rest of our life because we have Jesus. No, Jesus literally says you will have trouble. And there's a great argument to make that as soon as you become a Christian, you will have more trouble. But what I love is what that sandwiched between. In me, you may have peace. So we will have trouble, but yet peace in the midst of the trouble. Why? Because Jesus has overcome. He's defeated Satan. You see, but too often we, we believe that great deception. That it's like, yeah, we will have trouble. And that's all we cling to. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Stress, stress, stress. Anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. Guilt, guilt, guilt. And we just walk around over and over and over, like making that our whole life. But Jesus says we're free. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is there anybody here, by chance, that could use some rest? I could. Because I do have a tendency to take that stuff upon me. You know, to load it onto my back, the stress of life, the worries of life, the difficulties of life. And I'm like, all right, 
you know, I'll carry it. That's just, you know, what life is like. Is it? Or did Jesus tell me that he can take it? They, did Jesus tell me that I can have rest? Doesn't mean I'm not going to be sad, sorrowful. You know, there's things that are going to cause sorrow. God is sorrowful at times. But yet, in the midst of it, we have peace. We can have joy. You can have everything that you need to defeat the power of darkness in your life. We do not have to carry that any longer. I have an example. Actually, it's an object lesson, so to speak. I have this heavy bag, okay? I actually even put a weight. So, you know, have you ever seen those plays where it's like they act like they're carrying heavy bricks, but then they're like, whoa, you know? So I actually put weight, so it looks heavy. Now, imagine, if you will, that I'm going to carry this bag, okay? If I sling it over my shoulder and I'm carrying a heavy bag, I'm leaning a little bit, you know, right? Makes sense, right? It's a heavy bag. Okay? If somebody comes up to me and is like, what are you doing? I'm saying I'm carrying a heavy bag. They're not going to question the way I'm walking, are they? It makes sense. But if I was to drop the bag and I walk through life like this, and people come up to me and are like, why are you walking like that? Is that a justifiable question? Yeah. There's no reason for me to be walking like that. I don't have a heavy bag on my shoulder. Now, let's take this into a spiritual sense, okay? Before I knew Christ, I had my guilt. I had my shame. I had my doubts. I had my struggles. I had everything in the bag that we walk around with. And we lean over because it's a heavy bag, okay? All of our sin. We're just dragging it around everywhere we go. But you see, when I believed in Jesus, I lost the bag. I lost the burdens. Too many of us are still walking around like this. And you know in Hebrews, when it talks about the the host of heavens looking down at us, I believe that, you know, that they're looking at us thinking, why is he walking like that? Why is she walking like that? Why are they walking around like they're carrying a burden? And I think the reason is the devil has convinced us we are. But we have to understand that we are no longer carrying that burden. So don't let people look at you and say, why are you walking like that? Look at your own life right now and ask yourself, are you walking like you're carrying all that garbage before you knew Christ? You know Jesus. You stand tall. You know, because you are saved, not by your own strength, we saw that clearly, but by the love of Jesus Christ, you do not have a bag filled with burdens on your back any longer. You are free. Walk like a free person. You know, stand firm in in what the Bible says, the promises that he gives you. You see, I'm reminded of like when Moses stood before Pharaoh. And God commanded him to say, you know, let my people go, you know, so that they may go worship God. You know, and I believe that, that like in a sense, when Jesus died on the cross, he declared to the devil and to the demons and to all the darkness, let my people go. You are his people. You have been let go. You do not have those chains and that darkness over your life any longer. You have been set free to worship God with with a clear mind, without the stress, without the anxiety, without the guilt and the shame. Let it go. You're not carrying the bag any longer. You've been set free by the power of Jesus Christ. And that has nothing to do with your own strength or ability. It has everything to do with the God that saved you. That's why we lay our life down. That's why we say, I give everything over to you, that you may be glorified, Lord Jesus Christ, because he is the one that made us alive, that gave us life. In this world, we have one life to live, one life. You do not get a second chance. You do not get a repeat, a do-over. You have one life to live. What does that life look like? 
What are you choosing to make your life about? Are you going to continue to walk around doubting Jesus Christ? Maybe not even believing in Jesus and and believing that you're this good person that somehow on your own, you're going to earn your salvation on your own. It's a lie. You can't do it on your own. Your only hope is in Jesus. There's one way and one way only, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, that is our hope. And that is the only way. And I challenge you that if you are struggling in this area, if you feel like you're you're, you're carrying that bag of of the burdens and everything like that, and and it's kind of like, obviously, the theme of this message is start looking at the cross. You know, in um, Revelations 3, 1 through 3, it says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. There's going to be days where we all struggle. I struggle. You know, there's times where I'm like, oh, I just, I kind of, I, I, I feel like I just need to keep, pick up that bag of burdens again. You know, I just feel like, you know, I, I, I'm, I need to carry that because I feel bad or, or something's just weighing on my heart or, or I'm struggling to, to have that, you know, that, that belief or maybe even the faith. You know, and we want to, 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 you know, pick that up again. I love what this verse says. Remember. Don't ever forget. And what are we supposed to remember? What he did. Amen. On the cross, it was complete. There was nothing lacking in what Jesus did for us. You know, we don't need the cross and. There is no and. What Jesus did at the cross set us free. You know, that's what we need to do. When we start, like, the devil starts reminding us of our past. Take it. Remember, it was nailed to the cross. That guilt of your past, nailed to the cross. You know, the shame that you may feel about what you did, nailed to the cross. It's not meant for you to carry any longer. It's time for you to be set free, to believe everything that God has for you and everything that he has for you in a future with him. So I challenge everybody today, remember, remember the cross. You know, remember what he did for you and allow that that salvation to encompass you, to fill you. You know, I talked earlier about that friend who had that fervency. If you are lacking that fervency in your life for going all out for Jesus, remember what happened at the cross, that you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And in that state, he set you free. And he gave you salvation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would truly touch our lives, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to remember, to truly remember every single day what you did for us on the cross, that you have set us free. And Lord, I just pray that that you would rise up within us this fervency, a passion for serving you, Lord, that, that we never thought we would have before, Lord, that we would become not just a church, but an army for the living God, ready to go forth and and live our lives for God's kingdom and not our own, Lord Jesus. And I just pray this in your most powerful and holy name, Lord. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Church. You may also follow Georgetown Christian Fellowship with our app. Go to either iOS or the Play Store for Android and search for Word Server. That's one word, Word Server. And install the free application. There you will get all of our messages, including streaming capabilities.